Welcome to Mountain Strong. Today we are at Campbell Creek Estuary Park and enjoying a beautiful sunset. I'm here later in the day than I thought I would be. Uh, some ministry uh, related affairs arose that forced me to do some shooting later in the day. But I am thankful uh, to have come out at this time and thankful to share with you this beautiful place. Alaska is a truly special place and I want you to understand something though about, about this kind of scene. The sun sets everywhere. I encourage you to go out and have a look at the sunset as soon as possible and enjoy the firmament, the sky that declares the glory of God. Today we're going to have a look together at Psalm 25. Psalm 25. And let's go ahead and read it together. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Let me not be put to shame. Let not my enemies exult over me. Indeed, none who wait for you shall be put to shame. They shall be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. Remember your mercy, O Lord, and your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. Remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me, for the sake of your goodness, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my guilt, for it is great. Who is the man who fears the Lord? Him will he instruct in the way that he should choose. His soul shall abide in well-being, and his offspring shall inherit the land. The friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him, and he makes known to them his covenant. My eyes are ever toward the Lord, for he will pluck my feet out of the net. Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. The troubles of my heart are enlarged. Bring me out of my distress. Consider my affliction and my trouble, and forgive all my sins. Consider how many are my foes, and with what violent hatred they hate me. O oh, guard my soul and deliver me. Let me not be put to shame, for I take refuge in you. May integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I wait for you. Redeem Israel, O oh God, out of all his troubles. In Psalm 25, we once again have the psalmist facing enemies. This again is a theme that we've been seeing in the Psalms and we will continue to see in the Psalms going forward. And once again, we see enemies coming into the psalmist's life, not promoting fear or panic, but promoting inspection of self. And as you think about the self-inspection of this psalm, it differs from what we've seen previously. We know that at times when the psalmist is driven into himself based upon external enemies, he looks at himself and says, no, nope, there's nothing wrong here. I am on the right side of God. I'm on the right side of the issue and I simply need to ask God for my help and expect his salvation. But here in this psalm, the introspection that the psalmist does does not lead to that conclusion. Instead of having confidence in his self, he actually is afraid and he, he, he knows there are some issues that need to be corrected. But he does the right thing with those issues. He goes to God and out of going to God, he begins to have confidence first in himself, but then second as he faces his enemies. Notice the problem and an immediate solution in those first three verses. He says, I lift up my soul to you. I'm putting my trust in you. Let not my enemies exult over me. Okay, that's the problem. But then immediately there is a solution in verse 3. Indeed, none who wait upon you shall be put to shame. I don't have anything to be afraid of if I'm on the right side, if I'm on the side of God when my enemies come. But then he says, they shall be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. Those who are doing what is wrong have every reason to be ashamed and every reason to be afraid of their enemies. And so what does he say? He says, God, teach me. Teach me. I need to know. I need to know how to be on the side of the right. I love what this teaches us about facing conflict, about how we need to approach conflict with the idea that we could be wrong and the idea that if we are wrong, we need to be right. It doesn't matter what the enemies are doing to us. It doesn't matter how wrong they are. It matters what we are doing and what we are going to be doing going forward. 
whether or not we are going to get back on the side of the right. Because if we're not on the side of the right, then we're just as wrong as our enemies. So he says, teach me. But then he says, apply mercy to me. He says in verse 6, remember your mercy and your steadfast love. And because you remember those things, he says in verse 7, don't remember the sins of my youth. Uh, don't, don't remember me uh, because of my transgressions. Remember me instead because of your love and because of your goodness. And through those things, remember me. He says, teach me. He says, apply mercy to me. But then in verses 8 and 9, he says, you know, God does teach. And then in verse 10, he says, God is merciful. And so really, maybe the thing that I should be asking here is not just to be taught and not just to be viewed with mercy, but to be forgiven. And so he says in verse 11, for your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my guilt, for it is great. Forgive me. And notice how his desire to be taught and his desire to be extended mercy allowed him to see God for who he was, a God who teaches and a God who is merciful, and allowed him to realize that all I need to do is to ask to be forgiven. Now we know from the New Testament point of view, there is more to being forgiven by God than that. But for the person who is in Christ, for the person who has put on Christ in baptism, that's the way that it works. We confess our faults to him and he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, the Bible says in 1 John chapter 1. And so he says in verses 12 through 14, uh, out of confidence, who is the man who fears the Lord? That's the man who's going to be taught. He will be instructed in the way that he should choose. His, his soul will abide in well-being. His offspring shall inherit the land. The friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him. And so by asking forgiveness and by committing ourselves to the fear of the Lord, it's going to be okay. And so reconciling all of these ideas now, in verse 15 he says, I'm looking at this properly. My eyes are ever to the Lord, for he will pluck my feet out of the net. And so he then again says in verses 16 through 18, help me with my sin problem. In verses 19 through 22, help me with my enemies. But again, that's not where he began. He began with reflection upon himself, reflection upon his God, reflection upon what he needed to get right first, his sin, and then reflection upon what needed to be right second, his enemies. That's the way it should work in the face of conflict if we find ourselves on the side of the wrong. May God help us when we are facing enemies in life, whether that be interpersonal conflict, whether that be our enemy Satan. May God help us to always examine ourselves, to look inside of ourselves and be honest enough with ourselves to see when things are not what they ought to be. God bless you today.